three, uh, three contributions that will certainly um, give rise to, to questions, I hope. And, and I would ask people, um, as I'm going to open it up to the floor, uh, to ask questions of, of the contributors rather than um, make a, a further contribution. Um, so if there's anybody who, who wants to ask a question. A bit of difficulties with uh, workers and their representation and their rights is that you quite right to say that quite a lot has been apparently enshrined in law. And one of the, probably the, the downsides of the so-called national understanding the, 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 the collective bargaining process, the centralized collective bargaining process in the 80s and 90s, etc., is that Many of the major employers of labour that have come into the country are not obliged to have unions. In fact, they have very strenuously avoided having any kind of unions in their case at all. And it seems to me that that's one of the great weaknesses of the left and of the workers' movement in Ireland, is that in the general area I come from, there are factories with in excess of 4,000 people who are not organised. Um, this seems to me uh, is, is a major feeling, I think, uh, an unintentional, but nonetheless a feeling of the trade union, but I wonder if you could perhaps comment on that. Um, we'll no, take, so a, we'll take a couple of questions and see if there's... Uh, Gavin's contribution there uh, dealt uh, uh, industrial policy. Um, one of the things I just... Um, and I know you've mentioned it, is the cooperatives. And in Ireland, um, cooperatives are being basically bought out at the moment, the whole idea of cooperatives. And we have some very successful ones, which would be credit unions, etc. Uh, they were never supported properly, uh, that's one thing. But in the food industry, uh, the cooperatives in the dairy sector, for instance, would have been huge employers, generating money locally, into economies locally, and if they weren't there, I think uh, the population in the, in, in, uh, certainly in rural Ireland would be a lot less than it is now. And uh, even though the population is declining in a lot of places there. But um, the danger of some of the cooperatives, the ones that are being are successful, is that they're actually bought out then by uh, bigger companies. Like you, if you see Kerry Fields, Kerry Field Company, massive field company, um, they, have, they have facilities in, in the UK, in, in the States all over Europe, so it's, be, it's become a multinational company. It's not really a cooperative anymore. So I was just wondering, did you want to comment on how you would keep a cooperative, you know, tied into the country, and that it doesn't, you know, come along uh, with financial backing from the banks and buy out the people who are in the cooperative. That's one big problem that I think we, we will have. Uh, I know we're going to come to it later on, but there was, there is an idea of cooperative, cooperatives around housing, building housing, building companies, things like that, so maybe you can mention that. Yes, I think, Daryl, uh, in 1989, I was at a, uh, a lecture, Daryl gave it, on the, 19, on the dangers of the 1990 Act, which was being introduced <coughs> at the time by Berkeley Aaron, who was the Minister of Labour. Um, people in this party and other parties on the left argued against it. Um, I think the difficulty I have with any legislation is no legislation will organise one walk into a union. And one of the problems in Ireland is that we've always downplayed, even people who are in unions, and I, I'm a, a lifelong union member, an organiser, um, is that we downplay our own role and we, we downplay the actual idea of trade unionism. And for a long time, it was being uh, cowards to the uh, union union to draw hiding it. And that, that has happened. But one of the things people must remember, and I'm not supposed to make statements, but um, 600,000 people in unions in Ireland, north and south, it's about 25% of the workforce, maybe a little bit less. That is very, I mean, it's a lot lower than it was uh, years ago, but if you compare it with, and this is to the, one of the questions from there, compare it to what the union uh, density is in France, in Germany, it's actually higher here. So what, what can we do uh, besides look for more regulations and I know there's an act coming at us, but what can we do to lift that sort of sense of being a, a worthwhile thing to be in the union and that we actually have power? There's no other organisation or group of organisations in Ireland that has 600,000 members. So what can we do to, I suppose, politicise this? Yeah. Can we not approach 
pressure on organisations like the IDA in Paris Ireland to remind multinationals that people in this country have a right to join a trade union and that should be a condition of giving grants to multinationals and such. Thank you. Partnership, yeah. It's a difficult one, social partnership. Uh, leaving aside altogether the tactics of whether a union should enter social partnership or not, and there's lots of agreements and disagreements about that. In some places, social partnership in, in Scandinavia has been very successful from the workers' point of view. Uh, you still could be made criticisms of it. But my big criticism of social partnership here is, and it ties into John's question as well, the the problem about ideology, uh, the problem of believing that, you know, you are now a partners with capital, that the old conflicts between labour and capital had been sort of, to some extent, transcended, and that it was all a different ball game now, that we were now sort of partners. But as somebody said, very difficult to be a partner with somebody who'd prefer you didn't exist. And that was the situation. Uh, the employers paid no attention to it at all. They just didn't take it seriously. They, they were purely pragmatic about it. It, 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 it lessened industrial conflict, various things like that. So they were quite satisfied with it. The unions, though, were, some of them at any rate, were really quite, they really bought into the whole idea of a partnership and that, you know, conflict was a bad thing and that, you know, so, so I think that's the really serious aspect of the partnership. The, the, you know, you could go into partnership and say, yeah, Sure, uh, we'll go into partnership because it may happen to suit us, but we're going into partnership with, with an enemy, really, and we've got to be always on the lookout and uh, always be in a defensive, offensive position with regard to it, without being too bolshy, if you like, but, but you know, always keeping to the fore the conflict between labour and capital. And, John, you know, uh, what could the unions do? Uh, well... That, that thing I'm talking about, about, first of all, that you have to have a little bit of confidence in yourself, that you do a good job. Unions are necessary. You need to put that message out to uh, ordinary workers. People are quite shamefaced about trade unions. They don't stand up for them. Even trade unionists themselves uh, going around saying, like, you know, for instance, I've heard union officials say, well, you know, young people now, they, they don't want to be in unions. It's just not true. It's just not so. Uh, anybody who works... You know, you know, it's self-evident to me, at any rate, maybe not, to, but to me, you know, a union is necessary because of the disparity in power and the conflicting interests. A union is essential. It's, it's good for the worker. It's, it's good for the society. You know, those arguments are not made. They should be made. Uh, and, you know, I'd favor the sort of, you know, during the 80s and particularly the 90s, the idea of the, uh, the service model of trade unions, this idea that you know, you got sort of credit cards and uh, insurance and um, uh, you, you, you do your individual representation on the law as a sort of lay lawyer, if you like. Uh, but, you know, okay, I wouldn't dismiss it totally, but you need the organising model that goes out and organises uh, uh, workers. Based on very directly on the point about an enterprise island and the idea mm -hmm. of multinationals being told people have a right to be in trade unions. The fact is, they are told that. This is what happens when you codify workers' rights under law in a capitalist system. The constitution of this country says everybody's got the right to be in a trade union. The corollary of that is everyone has the right not to be in a trade union. And the attitude of the law in this country and the current legal position is everyone's got the right to be in a trade union and you'll have no right to be represented by that trade union. That's what the law says, that's what the multinationals are told, and that's what they abide by. The law is not going to change this. On the point about social partnership, there's a wonderful episode of Yes Minister where the minister's there in a discussion and he's on a debate show with a trade unionist and an employer and the trade unionist says, we need an equal partnership between unions, government and employers, but it has to be in that order. Social partnership can work in that sense, but we're, not, we're nowhere near to that now in this country and we never were. The fact of the matter is, and to address the points of both John and Mick, I hope, together, we don't need to reinvent any wheels to do this. Mm. This has been done before. Sure, sure. The first thing we need to recognize is that in the beginning of the 21st century, the movement of organized labor in the Western world 
is back to where it was at the beginning of the 20th century. And that is a mm. hell of a long road for us to climb back Absolutely, from. absolutely. We have done it before, and you do it by organizing. If you want to organize, the first thing you have to remember is you're going to lose more times than you're going to win. You have to go out, you have to talk to the people who are in the workplace, you have to engage with them, whether it's a multinational or whether it's this hotel or the shop across the road. You engage with workers, you help them identify what their problems are and what their solutions are, and you work with them towards those solutions. That's how we did it before, to establish a movement of organized labor the world over. That's what we have to do again. Just like at the beginning of the 20th century, it was the international communist and Marxist movement that were the best organizers that pushed the labor movement forward. We have to go back to that. So cooperatives are no panacea. They, they have problems in and of themselves. It's quite possible for a cooperative to act as a so-called petty bourgeois collective, uh, just looking after its own interests. And that means that you know at some point, the interests of the workers that are in that petty bourgeois collective, they're not just workers. They also have control of the capital. And then they can decide to sell it on to some other company, some multinational. And then the whole thing's gone, and you've got nothing left. Now, in many countries like Italy, you'll have, uh, you'll have red cooperatives, but you'll also have Christian democratic cooperatives. And you have, you know, there's a big ecology of uh, Christian democratic uh, cooperatives. So cooperatives in and of themselves can't, can't do that, that much. They need to be politicized. They need to be red cooperatives. And that's, that's the job of the political party, is really to try to promote socialism amongst the, the general population. And the more red we can make the cooperatives, the better off they are. So there's an ideological component. There are also other things. So for instance, in France, there are something called capital locks. And the capital locks mean that the workers cannot sell on. They cannot alienate it from, the, from themselves to, uh, to capitalists. And those sorts of things, perhaps, like it, you know, we could try to think about whether or not that's something that we'd want. There's also the possibility of utilizing trusts. So trusts uh, can have property which is inalienable. Uh, it can't go on to something else. It has to remain in the trust, and the trust cannot be sold on. Uh, so you could imagine a situation where you had a democratically structured trust that used that kind of legislation. Those are sort of technical fixes for something that in some ways is really a political problem. It's a massive political problem that people just aren't, don't have class consciousness. They don't have the idea of socialism or the, the, the idea that what we really need is to have democratic and social control over the economy. Now, there's one other thing I'd like to say quickly about it. Uh, in terms of uh, this, this idea of a, the, the small capitalist collective, there are ways also that we might want to think about uh, getting back the surplus from cooperatives for the general public good. And one of the ways that we really should be thinking about doing that is by having uh, red banks or a public bank, depending on how much power we have, that, uh, that can take back some profit share from cooperatives that it helps invest in in the first place. And that makes sure that some of the benefits of the cooperatives not only go to the workers, but that the surplus is going back to workers again. And that we use that surplus in order to try to build up an ecology of, uh, of the workers' movement. Thank you. And um, time is tight, so I'm going to take three. Very quickly, then. How about, you know, they've worked without a lot of pay? What do you think the workers are to get to The city engineer would be a member of a union. The fellow sleeping the road is also a member of the union. So the interest is not always the same. Uh, the multinationals. The reason to keep the main reason they keep unions out is they pay back on the conditions. And if we really were serious about the economics, we would go to those thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of workers who work for a small business. Why do you say? Uh, okay, okay, very quickly. Like, the other thing, and I think it's two things that I think of it. You will not organize unless you can protect the shop steward. It is nearly impossible now to get a shop steward on any of the private sector hubs that will be sacked and the unions haven't protected them. The second thing, or the last thing, and it was very, it seems most to Gill as most to Gill asked, what is the role of the union official? Is the union official there to protect the status quo? Or are they there, the left, and I'm talking about the left union, or are they there to challenge the bosses? 
they're not there, uh, they would say, uh, to implement or, uh, you know, to enforce agreements. They should be there to break the agreement and to improve the life of the work for the specific, you know, the specific task. Yeah, um, so I'd just like to say, first of all, I think um, we shouldn't underestimate how um, distinctive developing our industrial policy is, um, I think that actually probably the most, one of the most appealing distinctions between the Workers' Party and the rest of the parties on the left at the moment in Ireland, and so I think it's really great that it's, that it's being done. Um, I'd just like to ask in the context of what you've spoken about, Gavin, um, how difficult is it to implement um, these kinds of policies while we have the debt burden that we do, and uh, what are the thoughts in terms of how that should be approached? On the trade union uh, field issue, I agree that it's the law uh, seems to be in this country is hemming in uh, trade unions all the time. I'm involved in, in the ASTI, and every time we try to put forward something at our convention or, or our branch meetings, the answer back is, oh no, we can't do anything with that because it's the law. So, say for example, the new sick leave uh, that's brought in across the legislation, the, the teaching council now that we all have to pay out of our salaries into this another crony uh, organisation that's there, again, that's legislation, section 30, so everything that comes up is legislation, 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 and that's coming back from the, the trade union leadership, so, I mean, maybe it's a far left thing to say, but I mean, uh, there comes a point where sometimes these laws have to be broken, you know, uh, to, to do anything about it, because if we're hemmed in by these laws, uh, we can't just keep saying, well, we can't fight this because of, and unfortunately, I know some people, uh, I'm one of these people who are very critical of the trade union issue for seeing it at first hand from being involved in the union. I'm very, very critical because we have handled up time and time again different uh, things and we've seen how they've hid them or changed the timing that it came out or didn't want to, you know, there's, there, there are certain tactics that they use in head office to get things away from the table that they don't want on the table. And it's happening over and over again. And it's, I do, I understand what people, uh, some people have said in the audience that young people don't want to join you. Uh, the only reason they join is insurance policy, which a lot of it is true. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's oh well, if the, the boss does something to me, at least I'll have uh, they'll have paid for solicitors or something. Mm -hmm. And as you were mentioning, it takes years down the line to do anything. <coughs> um, but there's another side to that is if you take the new junior cert dispute at the moment. Sorry, is there a question? Yeah, well, yeah. Junior cert, the new junior cert is coming down the line, and. The ASCI has had 1,200 members just join in the last month, which is more than a joint uh, in years. Uh, so uh, I guess the question I'm really asking is, uh, where would you see something like the new teaching council, for example, organising within your union of a non-payment to that campaign uh, to bring it down, uh, even though it's against legislation? Where would where would, where would you see that? Again, the new sick leave, what about if everybody, through organisation, we manage to get support for industrial action against the new sick leave, even though it is uh, against the law? Uh, I just wonder what the panel's view on, on those would be. Thanks to the panel, I'm going to ask for, for very brief answers um, to them. I think one of the messages that, that we need to take from, from this forum today is, as I think it was Daryl said, um, constructive criticism of, of trade unions, as in any other organisation, is always a good thing. But I think the message that we need to take away from here today is the place where every worker is in their union, um, be they a young worker, an older worker, um, an engineer or a road sweeper, because that is where workers are protected. Um, so I think the message we do need to take is that oh, every worker's place is in their union. So, Gavin. Um, the first question was in, in terms of, no, actually that was the second question. But, uh, it, it may be, yeah, okay, but if, if that's okay. So if you well, combine, yeah. The, the those, debt question or which? Um, it was the, the um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, I mean, our world historic problem, right, is that we're skint and that they're not, you know? The capitalists <laughs> have all the money and we don't have it. And that's, that's the, the fundamental problem. And if you look at the debt burden in Ireland, there was just a straightforward transfer of the working class's wealth to the bankers. They lost out on bets and then they decided we'll cover those bets by taking it all from the working class. And not just us, but our children, because it's, it's a debt that goes into the future. So they're, they're taking everything that we make for a long time in the future. There's no, like, building up some sort of uh, 
industrial policy without any money is impossible. So somehow we have to be able to have some surplus from somewhere to start investing to try to build up a working class ecology. And part of that's going to have to be just telling the bankers to shove off. Uh, you know, they don't get our money for infinity. So really, we need to have some situation where we cancel those debts that were illegitimately stolen from us, literally stolen by bankers. So without doing that, you know, there's not going to be any money to invest in, in projects like state-funded uh, state enterprises, etc. So I'd say that definitely, you know, we have to have, we have to think carefully about how to get rid of that, that debt. Okay, so Gavin, do you want to, to sum up? Or you... uh, no, I'm all, all, okay. Yeah. Darren, can I ask you to answer any of those questions that were put in your summing up, which you've got two minutes? Yeah, okay, just on the IDA. During the 70s, the IDA actually did recommend incoming multinationals to recognize trade unions. They said, they said, look, this is the tradition in the state, you know, we're a sort of pluralist democratic state, uh, so, and we, what we do here is we do collective bargaining, so we'd advise the incoming multinationals to recognize unions, which, which they did. Now, after 1980, that was dropped. The IDA no longer made any mention of trade unions at all. Maybe the labor movement should have made a, a stir about that. Uh, just, I'm reluctant even to go into this, but your question about the teachers and about, you know, the unions. Now, look, unions are the democratic organisations. You know, there's always grubbiness. You know, there's always people who know the procedures better than anybody else. That's just the nature of things. Uh, and you know, it, you, you counter that by knowing the procedures yourself equally well, equally well, and agitating and you know for your 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 cause within within the union you know and it's it's never totally lost because it keeps pressure on the leadership to some extent but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough road okay thanks Darren. Uh, first of all, just to pick up on something Mick said about the difference between union members, and I think it very much ties in with something that Comrade Dunn mentioned in his contribution earlier. We do have, on paper at least, a fairly large union density in this country. Certainly the union density in this country is much higher than it is in Australia. However, it's spread very much across areas that wouldn't be generally associated historically with active militant trade unionism, especially in terms of the public sector, where there is near total union density. Now, the world over, the most militant trade union movements, most militant trade unions have always come out of blue-collar industrial work. Both male and female. It was in the mills, it was in the mines, it was in the trucks, it was in construction, it was on the docks, it was on the ships. That's where you would always find the most militant workers. And that's where there needs to be a focus in terms of bringing trade unionism back to militancy. In terms, regards to comrades from the ACI, I'd actually love to talk to you after the session, if possible, in terms of specifics, because I don't know any of the specifics of either of the issues that you've raised there. What I would say on it, though, is that we are talking about here turning around an oil tanker. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. Sure. The first motion to be put up to any conference would be to say, we think that our union should start lobbying to have certain provisions of the 1990 mm -hmm. Industrial Relations Act repealed so that we are in the future able to do this. Yeah, you may well have to accept the new sick pay scheme, the teaching council, as I said, I don't know any of the specifics, and you may have to accept we're not going to beat that one. Let's use this to be in shape to deal with the next one, and then the next one, and the next one, and it could be 10, 20, 30 odd years before you're going to get anywhere. Again, look at the history of it. There was agitation in the American labor movement for over 70 years before the Wagner Act was passed. You may not even live to see things get better. The point of being in this struggle, never forget this, isn't to see the results of it. It's to participate in it. Drill the holes, plant the seeds, and maybe somebody else ends up seeing the fruits of your labors. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. That draws to a close the first session, and I'd like to thank Gavin, Connor, and Daryl for um, very insightful uh, contributions, and to everybody for, for their questions. I think that was a, a lively and informative t debate. Um, I'd like to thank thank the, the comrades for that. Um, session two is solving the housing crisis, and if I could ask Arnie Mannion and Lorraine Hellesey. Before we go, can we have a round of applause for our chair? It's never easy chair questions here. and answers with this caliber.